touch up my appearance, lovely. <laughs> all right, hi everyone, and um, let's all welcome Julian. Um, he's an academic and a politician. He originally trained as a chemist, but he also served as the Member of Parliament for Cambridge from 2010 to 2015, and he was particularly noted for his work on technology policy and the environment. He is now Director of the Intellectual Forum at Jesus College here in Cambridge, which is an interdisciplinary centre aimed to foster thinking and discussion about many of the big issues of our time. And he's also the Deputy Chair of the NHS Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Cl uh, Clinical Commissioning Group. So a big round of applause virtually for Julian. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> and I, I like the sound effects. So um, you can hear and see me, everybody, I hope. Good. Um, I assume somebody will tell me if that changes. Um, so. What I thought I might do is just chat for a bit. Um, there's a couple of ideas I want to sort of talk about. Um, but the point is really to give the audience, whoever they are, time to think of things you'd actually like to talk about. So um, I assume somebody will tell me to, to shut up at some point. Um, but I'd rather, even in this, in this virtual space, um, try to an answer questions that you all have. So um, as I said in that, that nice introduction, I have a background both in science and in politics. And it's quite interesting, I think, to, um, or at least I found it fascinating, to work out what the differences were and how it felt different. Uh, I have to say, I, I thought that being used to a Cambridge Historic College environment would make Westminster make sense, but actually they're quite different uh, for a number of reasons. And I think it's, if you want to use any scientific understanding to change things, you have to understand the differences, you have to understand change, and you have to understand how politicians and policymakers think. So I'm gonna talk a bit about uh, all of those. So firstly, the difference between science and research and politics and policy. One of the big differences is perhaps best captured by um, a couple of quotes from Blair and Thatcher. So, so Thatcher said, uh, the lady's not for turning, Tony Blair said, I have no reverse gear. You would never buy a car that can't do a U-turn and has no reverse gear. But somehow in politics, we prize the idea of people who always stick to the same things regardless. Uh, it's often seen as strength. Um, you know, I don't want to get into party politics particularly, um, but we talk about Bernie Sanders or Jeremy Corbyn, and one of the praises is they've said the same thing for 40 years is that actually a good thing? We, we wouldn't have respect particularly for a scientist who'd been saying exactly the same thing for 40 years and hadn't changed their thinking because we know things change. It's also to do though with the shame of change. Politicians are criticized for U-turns, whereas again, academics, you'll come up with a hypothesis, you reject it. Now, we know that Popper's not quite right. We're not delighted when we reject a wonderful idea we had, but we're annoyed, but we accept it and you don't attack people for it. So one of the consequences of the fact that you can't change things once you've said to them is that one of the big routes to change is to get things changed before they're said. Um, and so actually the most effective things I did as an MP in terms of getting national change was about listening and hearing what's coming up what's going to be said next week, next month, whatever it might be, and can I get that to be something different from what was originally planned? That's a bit of a challenge. Um, but that's the goal, is to understand what's coming and how do you change it. Uh, what I might do, and, and one of the joys of this, is that I can't actually see any of the comments at the moment, and so I have no idea if you're, you're desperately telling me to stop or, or keep going, um, is I want to do a couple of uh, very rough bits of political science um, about how change can actually ever happen. So there are, thank you. Um, so there are, um, there's lots of scientific, uh, political science models which describe policy, politics, change. If I'm honest, most of them don't make sense to me, don't fit with my experience, but there are two that really, really do. And I just wanna pick up on those. So the first of these is the Overton window theory. Um, now, I'm going to try and see if I can uh, screen share and just show you this. Uh, is that working? Can you see this? I'm going to assume that's a yes unless somebody says no. Um, this is a interesting interface. I can see the chat stuff. Yes, good. Thank you. So um, first I want to talk about kingdom theory and 
this is ludicrously crude um, and takes some guy's wonderful work and condenses it into a couple of pictures. But he effectively says, uh, has a wonderful many streams model. So rather than a sort of uber rational model, and there are models which say that governments always optimize for all the possible con uh, consequences, there are different streams which go. So time is going downwards and there are problems. So at different times, different things are the problem. Um, that's going on. So at the moment it's coronavirus, but there's lots and lots of things and that changes over time. Now, ideally, we would have policy solutions to every problem, but in reality, policies are also a random stream of things that are wandering around over time, and perhaps it's best to think of these zigzagging across each other. So sometimes we have a policy solution to the problem that we have, but often we have policies that people are suggesting that, to be honest, it wasn't a problem, and then we also have problems that we have no idea what to do about anyway. You then have a third stream, which is politics or public perception or awareness, anything you like, as long as it begins with a P. And that's what people care about. And that's also evolving over time, but has no particular correlation with the other two. So there are things which people are really concerned about, but to be honest, they weren't a problem and we haven't got a clue what to do about them anyway. You can have times when any two of these coincide. We have a real problem. We're all concerned about it, but no clue. Here's this wonderful idea. Everybody likes the idea but there wasn't a thing to fix, whatever it might be. Very rarely, you get a time when all three happen to coincide. That is a kingdom moment, and it's when things can happen, when things can change. And so a really important way of thinking about bigger change is how do you take advantage of these moments? How do you get things ready? So one of the things that you need to do if you want to get change is to have your ideas ready and wait for a moment when there's a problem and political interest at the same time. So if you have a brilliant scheme of how to uh, reduce flooding, for example, if you just announce it on a random Thursday, it won't have any effect. If you take a time when there is flooding happening, people care about it, you have much, much, much more effect. These opportunities are missed all the time. You may or may not uh, like the current economic model, Post-2008, there was a real interest in changing our economic model to move away from the paradigms that we'd been in, but nobody had an alternative model. And because there wasn't one, that opportunity fled away. So some of this is about how do you get public interest at the right time? And there's been lots of work about uh, microbial resistance, for example, which has played around that. And some of it is about having your answers ready to go so they don't wait. Because one of the challenges for all the scientists is that we tend to think on very slow timescales. That's a really interesting question. Um, give me some funding, I'll have an answer in three years. Um, uh, doesn't work when you're in a crisis. So that's the first bit of theory that I find really useful. Um, so you have to get things done at the right time. The other one is um, the Overton window. So what you see on the screens is a, a, a straight line which represents policy. And again, the idea is that there's a, a line which is policy. It can be left, right. It can be authoritarian, liberal. It doesn't really matter what, but there's a spectrum there. And traditionally you have the aim of policy change to move that policy, to change something to be something else. That's not all there is though. And Overton, and again, to crudely oversimplify what he said, said, you know what? There's actually a window of things which are acceptable to say and that that window also changes over time. So for example, uh, shortly after slavery was, was made illegal in the UK, it was acceptable to argue for slavery. It was inside the window. It's now completely outside the window. Nobody really ever argues it. It will be considered utterly taboo to say that now. Some things move the other way. So. Uh, 20, 30 years ago for a politician to call to for the legalization of cannabis, for example, would be outside the window. Front page stories, utterly ridiculous idea. Now it's just sort of accepted and we haven't actually legalized it, but we're sort of on the verge of it and it's perfectly fine to argue it. So there are these unacceptable positions on each side and you can move that window over time to take in those unacceptable positions. Uh, universal basic income is a great example of this, where it was originally a ludicrous idea, 
that was just so completely far-fetched even conceptually you had to be utterly insane to even think of it and now it's a perfectly reasonable thing that's not happening but being piloted it might happen it might not you can agree with it you can disagree with it but it's not weird so how do you move this some would say that there's a lot of effort on this that's well understood by people like Boris Johnson so his comments about uh, if you remember those awful comments he made about women in burqas looking like letterboxes, that was only just acceptable. I mean, some of us think it wasn't, um, but it dragged the space over to start talking about immigration, start talking about Muslims, particularly women, in a toxic way that many of us wouldn't like. So it changed that acceptability. That's all I was going to say about that. Um, but I hope that that bit of political science was vaguely useful. The next thing I wanted to pick up on was the motivations of uh, politicians and actually civil servants in terms of how they understand science, research and evidence. There's this sort of slightly lazy assumption that politicians don't get it and don't care. And that's not quite true. So there are a set of politicians who absolutely get science. Um, they're not all scientists. Um, and actually, we're not really looking in politicians or in senior policymakers in general for technical expertise, because you can't be a deep expert in every bit of science. What you can be is somebody who understands it enough to know how to talk to somebody. Um, so my expertise was four-stranded DNA structures um, and how gene regulation happens, so biophysics, genomics. It didn't come up very often in parliamentary debates. In fact, I can tell you it came up precisely once which was me saying that it never comes up in debates. Um, but I got, I hope, science enough to talk to people who knew things and interpret what they were saying, to understand what uncertainty means, what it doesn't mean, and so forth. So there are some amazing people from across the political spectrum, uh, some historians who've been really good at it, as well as some scientists. But that's a small set in the civil service and a small set of politicians. There's also a set who are the scary ones who are, I would have to say, genuinely anti-science, anti-evidence. We see more of this in the US and in Australia, but there's a set here in the UK, and the classic example is a guy called David Tredinick, uh, now no longer a member of parliament. Um, he gave a famous speech in the beginning of 2010, I think it was, end of 2009, where he called for more money to be spent on astrology research. And he said, uh, for example, uh, so the moon has a huge effect on our lives. For example, surgeons won't operate during a full moon because blood clotting is ineffective. Uh, this is a testable hypothesis. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever cut yourselves during a full moon or live and live to tell the tale. You could ring up a hospital and say, do you cancel all surgery during a full moon? It is utterly absurd. David, by the way, served on the Science and Technology Select Committee and the Health Select Committee. So you should be worried about those views. Most people in this space, again, politicians and policy makers and civil servants, aren't in this. They're the sort of people I'm sure you all know who, in a UK context, stopped doing science at, at, at the age of 16 because we have this ridiculous A-level system. They're quite impressed by science and by technology, but they don't understand it. Um, they are keen on good things, but they're often the people who support slightly wide-eyed things. But, you know, we see this a lot in the technology space of, but surely it would be easy to run an algorithm to work out what age everybody is and do magic things. Because they, it, it all feels a bit like magic and they can't quite distinguish the real magic from, from just magic, um, from, you know, from scientifically deliverable uh, material. So they're often in favour of science, but not in a sort of very meaningful way. And so you have to work out how to communicate with them, how to engage uh, what it is that they want. Part of that is also about understanding what are scientifically amenable questions and what are in fact values questions that aren't really the preserve of scientists per se, although we may have a lot to say because we are also human beings with lots of values. So to give an example of that, um, I was quite involved in the debate about uh, mitochondrial replacement therapy. So this is to do with what became known as three parent embryos. <coughs> if you do it more accurately, it's more like 2.0001 parents, but you know, three is more catchy. 
and there was a vote on whether we should allow this to be done. And in my view, it's really important because we have patients with serious problems. People with mitochondrial diseases, it's immense pain. It, it, they're really awful. And we have a way to alleviate that. And technically, it's all possible. But it's not actually a scientific decision as to whether we should allow it. In the same way that we don't allow um, uh, germline mutations uh, for, for, for fetuses to enhance intelligence or do whatever. Now, some of those things, intelligence, not a great example, are technically, scientifically doable, but we have ethical concerns. But that's not about scientific evidence, that's about ethical decision. And when we had the vote, there were a lot of MPs who came up to vote, and I was acting as a sort of whip to get people on the right side, who came up saying, which way for science? It's an awful question because you can be pro-science and ethically have concerns about something, but they conflated it all with science or anti-science. Um, I mean, I have to say, I didn't have this argument with them. I just told them to vote the right way and we won comfortably. But it really taught me a lot about what it is that is good for science to feed into and what is not about that. And it applies more generally because the role, in my view, of politics is about trade-offs. There's no interesting politics in cases where, thank you, uh, where there is a clear answer. We don't really have a, a job to do, but there are where there are trade-offs. How much do we want privacy? How much do we want security? How much do we want to in half life expectancy for everybody? How much do we want to reduce health inequalities? Those are the areas where politics has something to say. Just very, very quickly to finish off, um, if you want to get change to happen, one important thing is to understand what it is that the person you're talking to is interested in. If you try and tell somebody, here's this great idea I have, here's the thing I'm passionate about, and they're not interested in it, you will never succeed in persuading them. And I see that time and time again. I'm excited about this, you must be excited about this, and then why is this idiot not listening? Understanding what somebody's drivers are, what is this person trying to you know they care about improving education for this reason then provide the thing we want to improve um air quality for these reasons fit to their reasons to their desires it's much more effective i was involved with trying to stop uh, indefinite detention for immigration purposes i think it's immoral that we detain people for years because we can't decide whether to let them in the country or not i think it's just fundamentally immoral we're one of very few countries that do it I persuaded a lot of people to oppose it because it's very expensive. It's not why I want to stop it, but I'm happy to stop it for those reasons. Um, I'll finish there, but just to say, do get engaged. There are lots of opportunities. Have a look at things like the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology. Have a look at CSAP here in Cambridge. Contact your local MP if you're concerned about issues. Look at select committees and join political parties. And that's perhaps my final word. Politics has a pretty dirty reputation at the moment, um, but it is crucially important. And all political parties are short of good people. Aaron Sorkin says in the West Wing that decisions are made by those who show up. And if those of you who are following this don't show up, decisions are made by definition by other people who don't necessarily share your values. So get involved, whatever your political leanings. And if you want to have some pointers, get in touch. I'm happy to direct you any way you want. Thanks for listening. I hope there's some time for questions. Thanks very much, Julian. That was a really, really great talk. Um, and I think we can all say that it's brilliant to have insights like that. And also it's brilliant to have someone to you know, stand up in this political climate and say, politics can be a good thing. Um, we need to keep Has to be, forward. has to be. Has to be, yeah. Tessa, over to you. Yeah, so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how you transitioned from academia into politics and whether there was a particular drive for you at that time. Um, so I have my own personal narrative. Um, I grew up here in Cambridge, both my parents are academics. Um, but my mother, for example, was born in a refugee camp in Uzbekistan uh, at the end of the Second World War. Uh, and they were then refugees in Poland, in Paris, and then made it out via the US to Australia. The UK was not accepting refugees then. And so I grew up very concerned about the rest of the world. Um, I got involved with programs like Model United Nations, 
was very interested in, in refugee and national development issues. And so while I was at school, was, for example, campaigning for 0.7% spent on international development aid. And so my vision was to try to pay back in that sort of global sense. Um, I then got involved domestically because while I would love to bring peace to the Middle East and save all refugees, it turns out it's actually quite hard to deliver when you're, when you're 17. Um, and so got involved with the Lib Dems while I was still at school, doing some campaigning and then at university and, and, and stood for the, for the council. Um, so I was always juggling an interest with academia with wanting to change things. I have to say one of my proudest moments was that I co-sponsored the legislation so that we do now spend 0.7% uh, of gross national income and international development aid. I think 17 year old me would have thought that was a career worth having, you know, even if that was it. Um, so for me, it was always about that, that worthwhileness. Um, and so I did both at once. Uh, and that possibly made it a slightly easier transition. I wasn't having to leap into a new thing. But there are lots of ways of stepping in gently that joining a political party, you can find out if it's the right sort of thing for you. Um, there are local events, there are regional events, there are national conferences. If you're at all interested, you have any leanings, go along. It's, it doesn't mean you have to say, er, you know, every single thing in this area I completely agree with, because that would be weird. But we'll all have some sort of values and see if that feels right. Um, but, but for me, it really came from that Rawlsian veil of ignorance idea. You know. I can understand that there are people who are a bit like me who grew up in difficult circumstances because I'm related to them. You know, it strikes me as very weird that sort of very lazy narrative you sometimes see as, you know, refugees are other. You know, I'm not one, but that's essentially luck. Yeah, I um, definitely agree. And I think people often see politics as sort of an all or nothing situation where you have to be either really, really involved or completely apathetic. But yeah. as you say, you can step in gently. Um, there's a question um, on the chat from Elizabeth about what made you go back to academia then after politics? <laughs> um, the electorate in their wisdom decided by 599 votes that I should um, return to an academic career. Uh, which was was very considerate of them, honest. <laughs> um, so, so I, mean, I, actually, I don't think I've talked politi politics at all, but I'm a, a Lib Dem and so served 2010 to 2015. Um, I think we made a bunch of errors. I think we did some very good stuff. Uh, I think history will be kinder to us than the electorate have been. I would say that. Um, and so it was a, a tough election in 2015. So, um, and then having lost, I was trying to work out what to do. Um, and I was quite fortunate, so I taught public policy at the university for a while. I, my lectureship was actually in physics, but to be honest, while I did, I think, some interesting fundamental work in biophysics and genomics, and it's, there's a lot of work building on it still, going back wasn't the thing. So I did public policy, and I now run the centre at, at Jesus um, called the Intellectual Forum, Which is where fantastic. we do all sorts of, thank you very much, uh, where we do all sorts of weird and wonderful things on multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary things, uh, come along to our events. Most of them are open to the public, they're not, they're not all, but actually it does give the opportunity to have some influence. But it's also, I think you gave that long list of other things that I do in the NHS with Joseph Rantry Reform Trust and uh, I do various other bits and pieces because it's a way of making a difference. We've got lots of questions rolling in now. Oh, sorry, um, I'll try to be quite quicker. <laughs> Should we just do those top? Yeah, so um, someone here is asking, how can we shape the political or social landscape to enable <laughs> politicians to change their ideas or views without being condemned for it? Um, uh, hi, Ola. Um, great question. And um, it's really hard. A lot of it stems from the problems we have with the media, which is very, very short termist, very, very sensationalist. Um, and the media sets up a situation, and social media is, is partly responsible for this, um, where it's very, very hard because there's that immediate reaction. You know, you said you wanted to do this, you now say that, why? And I think there's also a feedback where, about trust and trustworthiness. People don't trust politicians. And so you start off with this assumption, why is this lying bastard lying to me? Whereas actually, you know, um, there are politicians I, I don't have much time for, but the vast majority across the political spectrum are there for good reasons. You know, I might profoundly disagree with them on quite a lot of stuff, but they're there because they want to make things better. You know, and if you are 
on the left and you assume that Tories hate the poor and only want to help the rich, or you're on the right and you think that, you know, the left want to destroy all that's good about our country and destroy all progress, you know, whatever these narratives are, that's not why people go in. It really, really isn't. And where you do much better when we get across that boundary. So boosting trust and trustworthiness, I think will help. There's also though a difference and I think it's really important for politicians to be easily able to change the details, the policies, what you would do about something. But changing your values is a different thing. You know, I'd almost rather that we were voting on those sort of meta parameters, you know, that um, privacy and security are both important things. I would stand for election saying, and I rate them in a ratio of seven to three. And somebody else says, well, I would be doing them two to nine. And you vote on where on that meta spectrum you are, if that makes sense. Whereas I don't want Polish and say my precise policy would be we'd use this sort of system to do age verification on this way. And it will have this, this, this and this, because that's frankly, you should be free to change all of that. So th those meta questions to, uh, are important to me. Okay, great. Well, I think we're out of time, um, but thanks very oh, wow. much. Um, okay, um, so just to say on, 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 can I just very quickly on Eric's question, which I think was the last yeah. one there about ethics and technology, That's really, really interesting fun. area um, and something that I'm um, doing quite a lot of work on, both actually in government where I advise the Home Office on this uh, and through various other routes. I think the key thing very, very shortly is we absolutely can and must use AI. We should be aware that the biases from using AI are real. We should also be aware that there are human biases as well. And so let's not pretend that immigration officials are completely fair and unbiased. And only immigration, uh, you know, the, 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 any AI system would be unfair. Explainability is important sometimes, but not always. It depends how big the consequences are. And the real question is whether they are advisory and whether we say we know it doesn't work very well in these cases. So we escalate into different routes. Uh, so... Um, that's the last thing I'd say. I like the last comment and thank you very much for, from, your, from your typing to the rest of the country's ears. Um, but thank you all very much. Happy chat further if any of you see me around or message me. So all the best. Enjoy the rest Thanks of the Thanks very conference. much, Julian. So okay, so next up uh, we have Nick Scare, who is going to be introduced by... Jake. Jake. <laughs> I didn't forget start. to say, I was just like, I know. Uh, let me see if I can find Nick on here. Here we go. It's All right. It's been a long day. It's been a long couple of days. Nick, I'm promoting to panelists, so he should be joining us.